Coming up on our newscast, 65 years ago on June 25th, the war that divided the Korean Peninsula in two broke out. We take a look back in history, honor those who fought for freedom and democracy, and talk to those who long to be reunited with their loved ones across the border. And as many expected, President Bakune vetoed the revision to a parliamentary law. For reason, it could lead to the separation of powers as regulated by the Constitution. Though we are seeing more positive numbers with regards to the MERS outbreak in Korea, the economic fallout from the virus seems unavoidable. To counter that effect, the finance minister suggests a supplementary budget. All next on Primetime News. Welcome to Primetime News on this Thursday, June 25th. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Hwang Jie. Thank you for joining us. President Park Geun-hye has vetoed revisions to the National Assembly law that gives the parliament power to request changes to ordinances, including presidential orders. It's the first time President Park has vetoed an assembly-approved bill and the 73rd presidential veto in Korean history. Our Che Yusan starts us off. Before the cabinet decided to call on the National Assembly to again discuss the disputed bill, President Buck sternly explained that she had no other choice but to veto due to concerns over what she deemed administrative paralysis. She said giving the parliament power to request changes to ordinances infringes on the government's and the judicial branch's authority and therefore could be unconstitutional. <laughs> The president said it's apparent the ruling and opposition political parties rushed the passage of the bill, citing that lawmakers are unclear about whether the request requires mandatory action by the government. She also took aim at the parliament for neglecting the people while prioritizing bills for political gain. President Bak accused lawmakers of repeatedly blaming the government for not doing enough instead of passing bills aimed at revitalizing the economy and improving the people's livelihoods. In a rare move, the president targeted the ruling party floor leader, the chief negotiator for the bill and regular critic of her policies. Questioning the efforts of Yoo Seung Min in gaining parliamentary support for economic policies, President Bak said politics is not something that can be used for one's political philosophy or logic. By exercising her veto power, the president has risked a head-on confrontation with the parliament and with both the rival political parties. Analysts say it was a practical move as she couldn't have allowed the parliament to meddle in her running of state affairs, especially as she comes close to the midpoint of her presidency. Choi yoo Arirang News. Now, all eyes are on what happens after the presidential veto. For the National Assembly to pass the bill again, two-thirds of more than half of lawmakers present for a revote have to support the bill. But at the moment, the ruling Senate party has not decided to re-endorse the bill, while the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy has suspended all legislative duties. Our Chi myung Gil tells us more. The ruling's Henry party said it respects President Park Geun-hye's decision to veto the revised parliamentary law. We respect the president's decision to veto the revised National Assembly Act. The ruling party must carry out its duty. However, the main opposition MPAD lashed out at President Park for rejecting the law, which was passed through the assembly by both parties last month. The president does not respect the parliament, disregards the opposition party, and has a disdain for the people. She has denied the spirit of the constitution and undermined democracy. The MPAD suspended all legislative duties until the rejected law was put up for a vote again, as granted by the constitution when a law is vetoed by the president, but the ruling party objected the motion. 
Meanwhile, Henry Party's pro Park Geun-hye lawmakers criticized the party's floor leader Yoo Seung-min for negotiating the controversial revision with the MPAD when the presidential office was against it. They demanded Yoo's resignation, but the embattled floor leader brushed aside such demands and instead apologized, adding that he would endeavor to become a better negotiator for the party. With the opposition party's decision to boycott all parliamentary affairs and no consensus between both parties regarding a revote, the parliament has now come to a complete standstill. Kim young Arirang News. Today, June 25th, 2015, marks 65 years since the start of the Korean War. And to remember that fateful day, a commemorative ceremony took place in southern Seoul. And our Connie Kim spoke with some of those in attendance, many of whom are still clinging to the hope of a reunified Korea. When North Korean forces invaded South Korea 65 years ago, no one knew it would signal the start of a bitter divide on the peninsula. To pay tribute to the sacrifices of the war fallen, Korea's Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs invited thousands of war veterans, diplomatic envoys from combatant nations and citizens. Prime Minister Hwang kyo used the podium to emphasize the importance of having strong security in the South, while also encouraging the two Koreas to make efforts for a peaceful reunification. Seoul is preparing for a reunified Korea by establishing a unification preparation committee. I hope North Korea, as a responsible member of the international society, will walk the path towards co-prosperity. More than six decades may have passed since the war broke out, but for those who fought in the conflict, vivid memories of the war still linger in their minds. When we were marching towards the north, I walked with my eyes shut because I couldn't sleep for such a long time. I also remember not being able to take my shoes off for almost a week. 21 UN member nations fought in the Korean War. Roughly 2 million military personnel deployed to South Korea during the conflict. We sent 85,000 troops to fight, fight the war and, uh, and lost, uh, uh, lost uh, 1,500. So it was a very uh, uh, meaningful event this, uh, this morning uh, to remember the veterans. As the world's only divided country, most veterans, diplomatic envoys and citizens at the ceremony expressed their yearning to see a peaceful reunification and a new chapter in Korea's history. Connie Kim, Arirang News. And the Korean War started when forces from the north launched a surprise attack on the south. And our Park Ji-won gives us a brief summary of a conflict that costs so many lives and leaves a nation divided to this day. The Korean War began with some 75,000 North Korean forces crossing the 38th parallel, the border that divided Soviet-backed North Korea and pro-Western South Korea. On the early morning of June 25, in 1950, 65 years ago, North Korean tanks reached the outskirts of the South Korean capital Seoul the next day. Within a few days, the city was taken by communist forces. In the following three months, they conquered nearly all of the Korean peninsula, except for some deep southern regions like Daegu and Busan. Eventually, the tide turned with the help of U.S. and U.N. forces. Western powers saw North Korea's attack as part of the rising threat of communism. The U.N. sent in allied forces composed of troops from 15 countries to stop the communist advance. 
On September 15th, General Douglas MacArthur, Commander-in-Chief of United Nations Command, successfully carried out the Incheon landing operation, restoring the South Korean capital Seoul in late September. And by the end of October, the Allied forces were nearly able to push back the battle lines to the northernmost provinces of the peninsula. It seemed like the war would soon end. But with a sudden massive intervention of communist Chinese soldiers back in North Korea in late 1950, Seoul was retaken by communist forces in January the following year. After that, the war became a bloody stalemate. Allied forces fought back and retook Seoul in mid-March of 1951, but the warring continued and the casualties grew. And that's when the U.S. began examining a ceasefire. American officials first proposed the idea to Russia in May 1951. After some two more years of negotiations and ongoing hostilities, an armistice treaty was finally signed in July 1953, bringing the bitter fighting to an end. The three-year war, which was the first major military action of the Cold War between the Western powers and communist countries, cost the lives of some five million people, both armed forces and civilians, and left the Korean Peninsula divided almost the same as before the war. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. And families separated by the Korean War wait restlessly with anticipation to see their long-lost relatives one last time. They all hang on to the hope that the two Koreas can put their differences aside for a while and restart reunions. Our Kim hyun bin met with one separated family member to hear her story. I went through countless restless nights thinking about my family and hometown. It all comes back to me suddenly. Sixty-five years have passed since the start of the Korean War. But 86-year-old Pyongyang Suk is still searching for her lost siblings in the north. She was separated from her family in Hwangyeo-do province in North Korea when she was 18 years old. Just a week before the Korean War began on June 25, 1950. Decades have passed. But Pyeon has yet to hear any news of her two younger brothers and sister in North Korea. Unification is my sincerest wish. I want to visit my hometown. I'm over 80 years old, so I don't have much longer to live. Hopefully Korea will be unified. I just want to find out if my siblings are still alive. Pyeon settled down in Seoul after the war and started her own family now proud grandmother. But the thought of her siblings bring her to tears even today. Pyeon is one of tens of thousands of separated family members here in Korea, desperate to hear any news of their families. Since 2000, there were 19 reunion of separated families between the two Koreas. But it all came to a halt in February of 2014, as tensions between the two countries have escalated. There are roughly 130,000 listed as separated family members in South Korea. But time is of the essence, as nearly half are no longer alive. Around 67,000 separated family members are still alive, desperately waiting for inter-Korean relations to improve, so they might have a chance to reunite with their long-lost family members once again. I hope the South Korean government will put more interest towards the separated families. They are not concerned about us these days. There is no news about separated families in the media, nor is the government doing anything about it. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang Arirang News. Shifting our focus to the MERS situation here in Korea, the health ministry has confirmed on Thursday that two more patients have died from the virus, raising the death toll to 29. A new case was confirmed today after a patient tested positive at the Good Kangan Hospital in Busan. The victim reportedly caught the virus while sharing the same hospital room with a MERS patient who wasn't diagnosed with the disease at the time. The total number of confirmed cases is now 180, of which 77 are currently in the hospital, with 62 of them in stable condition. On a brighter note, the number of quarantine has dropped by more than 460 overnight to 2,642. 
Meanwhile, the Sub-Parliamentary Committee on Health and Welfare has passed a set of MERS-related bills on Thursday. The bills aim at helping Korea respond better to outbreaks of contagious diseases. If passed, the revised health law will require the government to release a full list of infected patients, including their hospital routes. The Korean government plans to pump more than $13 billion into the Korean economy in hopes of keeping the country's growth in the 3% range. Our Shin Zemin gives us the details. Korea's finance ministry announced plans to inject more than 15 trillion won, or 13.6 billion U.S. dollars, into the economy to keep the country's growth in the 3% range. Finance Minister Choi Kyung Hwan said Thursday that the stimulus package, including the supplementary budget, will help counter the economic fallout from the current MERS outbreak and damages from the drought. The government will mobilize all available financial resources, including the planned additional budget and other state funds, to spur the economy. The minister added that it was too early to confirm the exact size of the supplementary budget as the impact of the MERS outbreak is still being monitored. But some say even the extra budget may not be enough. Although the supplementary budget was a much-needed boost to our economy, usually only 60 to 70 percent of the budget is actually reflected. The finance ministry lowered its economic forecast to 3.1 percent this year, down from its previous projection of 3.8. Korea saw its exports contract over 5.5 percent on year in the first five months of this year, and the unexpected MERS outbreak is estimated to have played a role in lowering the annual economic growth forecast by 0.2 to 3 percentage points. The government added that it will announce alternative measures by the end of next month on the country's key pending issues, including the staggering youth unemployment rate and the country's sliding exports. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. This year marks 50 years since Korea's first successful overseas construction bid. And for a look back at Korean engineers' accomplishments and prospects for the future, we turn to our Song ji -sun. Korean engineers won its first overseas construction bid in 1965, a $5 million highway project in Thailand. Since then, they've made history, along with some of the world's most famous landmarks, like the Burj Khalifa in the United Arab Emirates, currently the world's tallest building. Unlike the early stages when orders were mostly from the Middle East, Korean engineers have broadened their clientele, hitting the accumulated figure of $700 billion last week. Marking the 50 years of construction achievements on Thursday, President Park encouraged engineers to take on greater business opportunities, utilizing Korea's advanced technologies such as smart cities incorporating IT technicians. She also called on the industry to actively engage in infrastructure projects in emerging economies in Southeast Asia and South America. Through such efforts, it's anticipated that Korea will hit the $1 trillion mark for overseas construction in the near future. Currently accounted for about 8 percent of the global construction market share, Korea is ranked six behind Spain, China, the U.S., France and Germany. Song ji Arirang News. Korean experts and officials have been putting their heads together at the Milan World Expo to discuss how Korean food or hanshik can be used to draw more international travelers to Korea. Our Na Young-gil files this report from Milan. Officials from Korea and the OECD held a one-day conference at this year's Milan World Expo to talk about how Korea can better utilize the concept of hanshik to boost tourism. This comes as hanshik is winning global recognition as a healthy and sustainable alternative to heavy high-calorie diets found in other parts of the world. I hope there will be active discussions on how each country's unique specialty food can successfully be integrated with competitive contacts to promote the development of the tourism industry. Korean cuisine has evolved over the course of the country's roughly 5,000-year history, adopting the science of storage and fermentation of food. It's this very aspect that leads experts to believe Hanshik has a lot to offer the global community in terms of food security and nutrition, and also why this aspect should be highlighted more to give a strong context to Hanshik. And I want to understand what the Koreans uh, want to say about this uh, uh, Hanshik, and I think people will come from all over to understand and to discover that and to take it home. 
In that sense, the Korea Pavilion at the Expo serves as a great venue to spread the word far and wide as visitors can see firsthand the concept of Korea's traditional method of storage and fermentation. After learning more about the food, they also have the option of tasting hansik. With experts emphasizing the importance of a story and strong brand power, the government is working hard to promote the health benefits and uniqueness of Korean food and the knowledge that this will eventually bring in more visitors to the country. Nae Hyun-kyung, Arirang News, Milan. We now connect to our Paul Yee at the News Center for the top international headlines. Paul, let's start with the latest on the Greek debt crisis. Any signs of a breakthrough? Well, despite high hopes earlier this week, the Greek government and its international creditors have yet again failed to narrow their differences. However, time is quickly running out with Athens just days away from defaulting on its bailout debts and being forced out of the European Union. On Thursday, Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras resumed a last-minute talks in Brussels with EU leaders for the second straight day. It comes after Eurozone finance ministers cut short an emergency meeting to approve Greece's latest reform measures. Um, we have just informed the ministers on the um, process and the progress being made so far. Unfortunately, we've not reached an agreement uh, yet, but we are determined to continue work. This work will go on during the night, uh, if necessary, and we will reconvene. So we've now adjourned the meeting and we will reconvene at 1 o'clock tomorrow in we order to take stock of the situation. Officials say that talks could drag on for another two days. Greece needs to come up with 1.8 billion U.S. dollars to repay the IMF by next Tuesday. But without a deal this weekend, the country may not be able to receive the emergency funds in time. And turning to the Middle East, Islamic State fighters have resumed their offense of launching deadly attacks against the Syrian border town of Kobani. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said intense fighting erupted between Kurdish forces and IS militants on Thursday. At least 15 people were said to have been killed, while 70 others were wounded. Syrian state media said the radical insurgents entered Kobani through Turkey, a claim that Ankara's foreign ministry has strongly denied. And finally, U.S. President Barack Obama's latest speech at the White House was interrupted by a heckler on Wednesday. But without missing a beat, Obama fired back at the protester, calling the person's actions disrespectful. And I've told you that I'm so hopeful about what we can accomplish. I've told you that the civil rights of LGBT Americans is... Yeah, hold on a second. I, uh, hey. Yeah, l l listen, you're in my house. <laughs> Obama had been hosting an event to celebrate LGBT Pride Month ahead of a Supreme Court decision to overturn state bans on same-sex marriages. And that wraps up our look at international stories for now. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Much needed rain has arrived earlier than expected with showers soaking the central parts of the nation from early this evening and the rain should continue overnight. And torrential rains will pour down Jeju Island as well as the southern coastal regions with a possible heavy rain advisory being issued for those areas while the capital and the surrounding areas will receive somewhere between 5 to 30 millimeters of precipitation. So it's going to be a rainy Friday here in the capital. Be sure to have an umbrella handy and dress warmly before heading out tomorrow as the daily high here in the capital and Daegu will be much cooler than today, only rising to 23. And Gwangju and Busan will climb up to 25 tomorrow afternoon. And as for the other parts, it seems like Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 29 and 27, while Tokdo rises to 22. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the international weather for views around the world.
on this painful but important day in Korean history. We are reminded that to be entitled to freedom, we must be vigilant in its preservation. And remember the sacrifices made to attain it. And that does it for us. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Hwang Ji-hae. And this has been Daniel Cha. Do join us again same time tomorrow. Goodbye for now.